Дорогие коллеги, доброе утро. Московское время 10. Good morning. Moscow time is two minutes past ten, and that means we can start our conference. I will start with a brief technical reminder for our Russian-speaking participants, colleagues. If you participate in the refresher course, you can register on the site. In the program, there is a link there. You can use it and register. Traditionally, any conference starts with a message of greetings from the university where it is conducted. You see that this year the conditions of our conference have changed, but on behalf of the administration of the university and the large team which prepared the conference, allow me to welcome you in the premises of our university. Uh, they are virtual uh, premises and uh, I would like to announce so the conference, the Magic Innovation Language and Language Teaching in a Changing Environment. The, co the conference is open. It should be um, accompanied by applause. We don't have it now. And of course, we miss it terribly. We miss the feedback and your contacts, communication with the colleagues who have recently come here. And there are many of you in among the participants. And I must say that the conference is very representative. When we understood that we'll have to arrange an online conference, so we um, thought whether this is worthwhile, because all of us are very tired of this online communication. And uh, uh, 10 days before the end of the, of the registration, I shared my apprehension with my colleagues in the organizing committee, and we decided that probably we shall not have a full-fledged conference, but a seminar. But these apprehensions uh, were unnecessary, we see that uh, there are many um, participants who have registered and received applications for over 400 people. Out of these applications, uh, we have chosen a smaller number. You can see now that uh, we have uh, 190 section reports and uh, 330 participants from 26 different countries. And you see that despite the format, uh, we have tried to make up for absence of communication and arrange the different sorts of contacts during the work of our conference. On the one hand, this large number of participants is a matter of pride for us, and despite the fact it's not our first conference, it is still a matter of great interest. And on the other hand, we understand that we represent various regions, various universities, we have different experience of using uh, distant technologies, and uh, therefore it's difficult now to foresee uh, how our communication is going to proceed. I want to say uh, from the start that we have a technical team helping us with the um, conference and they, they'll do their best to ensure the technical success. But of course, uh, I know uh, our teachers and uh, I'm sure that we will be able to find the wrong link and will be lost in this network of communication or probably um, press the wrong button and uh, half of the town population lose electricity. Well, uh, I just want to say that uh, technical glitches are inevitable. Please be patient and uh, take it with humor. Any experience of this nature of uh, remote discussions is very useful for us uh, in uh, the new conditions. I think it's common uh, statement nowadays that distant technologies will not uh, um, recede in the future. They are to stay with us, uh, let alone uh, the consequences of using uh, distant education in the education process. So I uh, believe uh, that our task is not only to learn to coexist with the uh, technologies, but also to master them, uh, to send them in the channel or along the path which is good for us. And to do this, we must understand not only the uh, essence of uh, the uh, communication technologies, but what we want from them, what is our goal, how we can prevent uh, the negative consequences. Definitely, I do not believe that everything depends on us only. Of course, existing in this distant environment is a complicated story. But I hope you will agree with me that uh, the lemonade we are going to get from the sour lime which we have received depends to a great extent on us as well. And therefore, how we use these technologies, 
will be discussed by us in the framework of our conference today and tomorrow. Traditionally, our section discussions and our workshop discussions are uh, uh, preceded, uh, no, our, our uh, conference is preceded uh, by the message of greetings from the authorities of the university, and I would like to give the floor to the rector of our university, academician of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Professor uh, Anatoly Turkunov. Dear colleagues, dear participants of the conference, guests of the conference, I would like, first of all, to cordially greet you. Uh, this is uh, the uh, fifth time uh, the MGMO opens its doors uh, for the participants of the conference, the magic of innovation. And, uh, of course, uh, there are certain uh, uh, certain changes and new elements uh, today. Uh, this is an online conference, but I am absolutely sure that uh, this will not prevent us, you from having interesting discussions. And then you will um, work out uh, recommendations for yourselves and for others at the same time, you will have a chance to communicate, to have contacts with each other, because communication is uh, that treasure which cannot, uh, which we cannot lose because of the pandemic. And uh, we have received now new methods of communication, which we have not uh, had uh, before. And the use of these new technologies, the new instruments, uh, will be the subject of this discussion, of this conference. Naturally, language and language in the education in the present conditions. Uh, so this process looks in a different way now. Uh, the language itself and the education process, they all look differently because uh, uh, distant education, uh, which was uh, somewhere um, on the background, uh, was so somewhere on the margin of the education process, has now become the instrument of the education process. And for us, uh, a global challenge in the new reality. Therefore, moving and using uh, distant technologies for us is a test, a test of the whole system of education, nationally and globally. It's my pleasure to uh, note that here in Gimo, rather unexpectedly for me, to be frank, managed to adapt ourselves very fast to the new conditions, to the new environment. And practically, without losses, without a single day, no, it took us just one day, yeah? to um, restructure our process and then to start regular classes, including regular classes in 52 foreign languages. And uh, we uh, had online, we had and have online classes. And I must give credit to our professors, to our teachers, our language teachers, who spent several hours sitting in front of the computer screen and uh, working in the, uh, with very close contact uh, with small groups of students. So this contact was very fruitful, and the teachers managed to uh, had enough stamina to survive this. I'm proud of our teachers, uh, and I bow to them. Uh. And I would like to emphasize one more thing. The teachers who in the past did not have much experience uh, with the distant education technologies, uh, they understood the need for this experience and learned very fast to work uh, in the new environment. And uh, they have learned to use uh, various opportunities that distant education provides, uh, uh, specifically in the sphere of uh, language teaching. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, acquired a very um, important experience, which we should not give up in the future. And uh, as a matter of fact, we still have some classes using this distant format. Though I'm happy to say uh, most of the classes are conducted uh, on the premises uh, offline, but still students have one or two uh, online uh, days of education, including online uh, language classes. It is clear that we are now witnessing uh, very serious, very profound changes in the system of education, industry of education. It is undergoing changes and uh, I think that uh, these uh, changes are irreversible, uh, even when the pandemic is over. And in the first place, uh, I would like to note uh, that uh, we are witnessing globalization of education, of the education sphere. Many skills are becoming obsolete very fast. Many competencies get out of date. As uh, technologies, the number of technologies are growing, uh, including using the artificial intelligence. There is a demand for individual educational services. So the competition is growing uh, more acute among universities, not only nationwide, but uh, 
uh, in the whole world. And the importance of online communication is growing to, for example, social networks in the sphere of networking, especially among young people. And uh, uh, we understand these realities and understand that our language is changing very fast as a means of communication uh, and uh, specific languages are changing. Therefore, we must not only uh, notice these uh, changes, but also to record them and uh, to uh, take this into account in the teaching process. Therefore, those who come to the university, I mean, uh, the school leavers who come here are different from the school leavers six or five years ago. This generation is sometimes called Google generation, other uh, words. But it's clear that as they come to the university, at the time when an iPad or computer is uh, uh, the continuation of their hand, uh, because they pra practically do not leave these devices. We know this very well when you know, we go visiting or visit public places and we see youngsters communicating with each other only uh, through telephone. It's sad to a certain extent, uh, but we must uh, recognize it and uh, um, accept it. We're working using new technologies in teaching and teaching languages. And we must understand that we're now working with a new generation. This is also irreversible. I must say that our teachers, most of them, I think it's true of other universities, our teachers feel these changes. That's why in this short uh, period uh, now we have new uh, courses uh, recorded uh, which give a chance uh, to the students besides online education working in direct contact with the teacher also to receive uh, recorded knowledge uh, recorded lectures and uh, acquire new possibilities acquire new con competencies as a matter of fact uh, i am in favor of very close uh, examination and study of what other universities have on their platforms, the Russian universities, global universities. It was my pleasure to see that among the participants, you have uh, many participants from British European universities. And so uh, we should use the platforms of other universities uh, as a complement uh, to um, teaching uh, students uh, languages and in other spheres in preparing students for profession, professional life. You understand yourselves very, very well that doing this individually uh, for, for the universities is difficult. Therefore, there will be some kind of uh, division of labor. Some universities will be more successful in one sphere, others in another sphere. Therefore, sharing experience is very important here, sharing knowledge expertise. At our university, we uh, use, as now we say, digital uh, methods in running the university and running the educational process and uh, 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 supervising the quality of the education process. And at the time of the pandemic, we content, content, conducted some student surveys about uh, the use of technologies at the university, taking into account uh, their analysis, their suggestions. And I, it is my pleasure to say that 85% uh, of the students uh, provide or gave high assessment of uh, the state of uh, these methods at our university. I think this university is another important step for us to find new approaches, new methods of teaching, and new methods of learning languages. And uh, I must express gratitude to the organizers of this conference. Uh, it is the fifth conference, the real professionals, the organizing uh, uh, team are real professionals who want to share their, their knowledge and receive advice, recommendations, the experience of uh, their colleagues, both from Russia and from other countries. And uh, uh, I follow very attentively uh, the uh, events organized at our university uh, uh, in teaching foreign languages as well. And I must say that the Magic of Innovation is a unique conference, a unique venue, platform for uh, studying various issues related to foreign language teaching. So, dear friends, I wish you success. 
I'm sure that uh, your conference will be a success and your today's conference will be a success story. Thank you. So dear colleagues, now I think we're ready to get down to our discussions and we start our plenary session. I would like to remind you that for the plenary session, we have three reports, one in Russian, two in English. Those of you who are interested to listen to the language of the original, you can move to the uh, English language um, report. For every report, uh, we order, we plan 35 minutes plus some time for you to ask questions. I want to remind you that questions and constructive comments can be left using the link uh, which you see uh, under the um, uh, under the broadcast, both on the side of the conference and in YouTube. We can start, and it is my special pleasure that we are opening up the plenary session with the report of my colleague, Professor Olga Kulikova from English Language Department Number One, a very profound specialist with various interests, scientific interests, and what is most important, she can combine theoretic research and the practical work. She is the author of many textbooks and manuals, various books which are at the juxtaposition of linguistics and language teaching, lingua didactics. And today's uh, presentation will not be an will not be an exception. The report is linguistics and language teaching in the changing academic and educational environment, teaching foreign languages for specific purposes. You're welcome. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, as uh, the subject of our conference is language and language teaching, so I would like to point out uh, main characteristics uh, for the modern uh, education teacher and uh, determine uh, its future development. Uh, so let's look, uh, look at uh, the places where we are now. And I would like to generalize uh, what is now relevant uh, for the academic uh, environment. And uh, if you recognize what I am going to talk about, that means uh, that uh, we, have, we are in the same environment, which makes our life easier. We should remember that nowadays we exist in a new reality uh, with the distant education, uh, online communication. This has become a norm. And uh, people believe uh, that moving to online communication opens up new possibilities for us and also creates problems. However, um, recent research uh, suggests that uh, in reality, these uh, skills are not so much technical ones, but uh, they are communicative. Uh, it's natural that uh, during the online communication, these skills are being reviewed and revised. That is important to maintain a certain level of voice production, to control your body language and uh, uh, take into account uh, the available uh, software as well as control your facial expression. These live uh, online communication, mostly non-verbal, um, dictates a need for adaptation. Um, the changes uh, in our professional work have led to a number of issues uh, and challenges in the academic uh, environment, and each of these issues deserves a separate uh, consideration. And um, mostly this uh, has to do with digitalization uh, of education and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, we should focus uh, on the specificity of the modern uh, communication environment. And uh, here we should uh, consider the so-called smart education, which is a kind of an educational paradigm, uh, which allows uh, uh, smart technologies uh, to assist uh, teaching and education. And I would like to focus on the main principles of smart education as reflecting the main uh, 
um, requirements and demands of uh, today's education. So one of the key principles is that of the using of the relevant uh, actual current uh, information uh, to um, use uh, this information in uh, education, and that has to do with the acceleration of uh, information flow, like in any other professional uh, area, and uh, the teaching materials should be uh, continuously supplemented by the recent current information so that our learners should be ready to handle practical tasks. And um, what's more, it is important to teach uh, learners to engage uh, in uh, autonomous and independent work on projects, uh, uh, information search and research. Thirdly, uh, implementation of uh, education in the so-called extended uh, uh, environment. So the education environment should not be limited to the campus uh, or um, should not be limited by the distant education framework, and it uh, should also be a continuous one. Here I'd like to stress that uh, some searches uh, suggest that the flexibility in individual trajectories uh, uh, could be aided by an electronic course book. Uh, it may or may not be so, but this should be discussed as a separate uh, issue. Uh, and um, all of those um, principles uh, are interrelated and interconnected, uh, as we can well see. Prioritizing education today is not an easy task. Uh, and uh, in this sense, both practitioners uh, and scholars are engaged uh, in um, studies, uh, discussions, conferences uh, of various levels and various size. Here is, uh, in particular, uh, is the description of some of the priority events. Uh, I will not mention on all of them um, for the sake of time saving, for lack of time, but. Uh, in both in uh, common linguistics as well as in language teaching, what we are observing is uh, a shift of paradigm. In uh, language teaching today, the most uh, um, the focus is on the personal uh, paradigm. Uh, on the uh, human uh, uh, being, on the learner, who should always be at the center of our attention uh, as language teaching. Uh, a lot depends on the approach uh, and uh, a viewpoint. I will focus uh, on linguistics and language teaching um, through the prism of uh, teaching um, foreign language to uh, non-linguistic students, uh, to those those who will need uh, a foreign language uh, for their future professional work. Here we should uh, uh, return back uh, to the starting point uh, of our key issue and to see what is the overall goal of teaching a foreign language today. Today, this means more than simply imparting knowledge through forming the necessary competences, but uh, it is about uh, teaching to learn. Um, uh, learning to learn, which means uh, acquisition of knowledge, interization of knowledge, uh, and full mastery of uh, skills and competences. And here it's a meeting point of various sciences uh, and subject areas. We are moving towards uh, the area of integrated knowledge in language teaching. Sorry, there's 
some technical difficulty. Uh, today, the notion of knowledge is undergoing a change uh, due to um, different trends and tendencies, uh, often contrasting ones. Uh, uh, on the one hand, specialization, and on the other hand, it's the uh, diversification. The knowledge becomes even more esoteric, and uh, sometimes it could only be um, understood by specialists in very narrow fields. But uh, as these trends uh, coexist, they generate um, uh, um, fields of uh, integrated knowledge or fields of polydisciplinary knowledge. And as Vernatsky said, that uh, um, the various uh, between um, individual sciences are now being um, removed uh, in uh, the most important phenomenon, perhaps, uh, which is common uh, both to science and education is the hybridism. Uh, if uh, previously we thought of certain things uh, as uh, contrary to one another, they um, seem to be blending into a single whole. Um, from either or, we are moving to both and, uh, and uh, this is relevant to both uh, organizations and uh, individual persons in the sphere of education. And uh, what uh, could this suggest for the purposes of linguistics and uh, language teaching? Uh, the phenomenon uh, that has been well studied uh, in uh, today's linguistics uh, is uh, only relevant today to language teaching, namely the multidisciplinary fields uh, which uh, are which find their way into uh, language teaching in terms of uh, communicative uh, motivation, uh, uh, teaching, and uh, also to uh, students uh, of uh, such professions as uh, diplomacy, law, and many others. Uh, in a recent report by Rodchenko, uh, I um, paid attention to his focus of the narrative, uh, which is an important consideration and uh, brings us further to the uh, issue of linguistics and language teaching and their connection. Um, now let's focus on the transfer of knowledge and as applied there to education or language teaching is seen uh, as more than uh, a simple imparting of knowledge knowledge from the um, source to the recipient. It also implies uh, um, processing acquisition of the uh, interiorization of knowledge and the priority here being to um, the teaching of uh, foreign language for specialized purposes uh, and uh, to the more uh, efficient ways uh, of the transfer of uh, language, uh, foreign language uh, for specialized purposes uh, through um, in a cooperation of various um, subject areas uh, and uh, the model which reflects uh, this uh, approach to transfer of knowledge uh, uh, implies uh, the epistemological model, which could be imagined as follows. Uh, the transfer of knowledge from the source to the recipient, uh, uh, processing and uh, um, appropriation of information uh, towards uh, interization uh, and uh, um, free command. And we should also stress one of the key attributes uh, of the educational landscape today, which is uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, um, approach. Um, uh, the studies published uh, in uh, English language media uh, 
um, suggest the importance uh, of uh, um, subject-specific competence uh, of uh, an employee in uh, um, terms uh, of professional development, uh, such as uh, knowledge of at least uh, two foreign languages uh, for specific purposes. Uh, and uh, it is uh, also important for those uh, students um, to whom um, the learning of the foreign language uh, is not needed for um, them as future linguists, but uh, as a tool uh, for professional development and as a means of uh, professional development. This is uh, quite uh, relevant today because uh, um, scholars today insist uh, on a holistic uh, or an uh, all-round assessment uh, of uh, linguistic uh, competence. Um, and uh, modern um, academic and educational uh, environment uh, relies on anthropocentrism, integrative approach, and interdisciplinarity. And uh, we are now uh, witnessing uh, a trend towards internalization of um, research and education. Um, as um, concerning the teaching of foreign language, uh, uh, we should uh, uh, focus uh, on the close uh, um, interrelation of all these uh, attributes uh, of these uh, specific model, uh, which focus uh, on the uh, person or learner-centered education, particularly at the advanced uh, level of uh, learning. And um, the, the cognitive um, um, characteristics uh, of a learner should be taken into account in order to uh, improve the outcome uh, of uh, learning. And uh, this in turn serves uh, to improve the overall quality of education when we um, appeal to the uh, personal um, characteristics of a learner to the uh, private uh, and personal interests, uh, we uh, improve uh, the quality of education. Uh, Post uh, positivist uh, uh, studies show that uh, the intellectual dedication uh, should be seen uh, as the key to success, uh, which presupposes a personalized attitude uh, to uh, the teaching material and to the process of learning as a whole. And uh, this uh, is true uh, as to teaching communicative practices, because that in turn correlates with the question of who is our student, who is our learner. And uh, this we rely on uh, the findings of psychology, neuro-linguistics, uh, and uh, I would like to outline uh, a few uh, points of interest. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Stillman, uh, for instance, uh, has been um, involved in studying the generational issues. Uh, and uh, uh, of particular importance is that today we are seeing um, the um, people of Generation Z who are now filling in uh, jobs uh, in the labor market. Uh, and uh, they uh, are um, characterized uh, by the syndrome of uh, fear of uh, missing out, uh, which in turn um, 
makes them um, seek uh, uh, competitiveness, but at the same time, uh, they would rather uh, rely on uh, um, personal as well as uh, collective effort uh, in achieving their goal. These uh, Z generation persons uh, have a number of uh, cognitive attributes which should be taken into account when designing a course uh, of a foreign language. Uh, one is the cognitive need uh, involved in the learning process, uh, their interest uh, in uh, um, information processing, uh, their readiness to take part uh, in the debate in this course, in our case, uh, a professional uh, discourse. And uh, we should uh, then focus uh, on forming meta compasses, uh, which are understood uh, as uh, uh, the ability to operate uh, the existing set of knowledge as well as uh, to form. Um, new ones, uh, and the education uh, should also focus uh, on uh, the teaching to learn, uh, on uh, ways uh, of um, adapting to a professional activity. Uh, sharing knowledge with the learner is an important uh, aspect, but what's more important today perhaps uh, is to Develop to develop their abilities uh, and uh, um, to learn today means uh, uh, to learn to find new solutions uh, in uh, uh, new circumstances. When we are considering the forming of new competences, uh, we should also remember that we are dealing with specialized uh, knowledge, uh, which is reflected uh, in um, a professional or professionally uh, focused texts. Uh, the knowledge of what uh, now is being transformed uh, to the knowledge of how, which is uh, part of the communicative uh, competence. Uh, and uh, some um, sta the stage of the application uh, of the acquired knowledge to practical uh, activity becomes uh, more important uh, using simulation technologies uh, uh, decision making situations uh, relying on the accumulated knowledge and the linguistic uh, competences. Uh, learning through action uh, as the basic principle of communicative approach could be um, implemented through role plays, uh, business games, uh, debates, uh, and uh, in our case, is uh, the most efficient way of controlling the new knowledge. Uh, this kind of approach uh, centered on an individual that I have described uh, um, means uh, that there should be more independent activity on the part of the student. Uh, to adapt to it, uh, students have uh, to change uh, their psychological approach. The same is true of the teachers. Both of them, as we understand, uh, favor individual approach of the student. But when students come to understand the additional uh, responsibility, start to avoid, shrink away uh, independent work and prefer the uh, traditional work at home with exercises. I think that the key is in heuristic kind of education. This is improving uh, the amount of independent work of the students thanks to heuristic submersion. This is the kind of education when uh, for several days uh, the education dominant prevails, which provides for the student participation and the acquiring of the education object. The center of the heuristic education is the heuristic situation. Sometimes it is called the situation of activating non-knowledge. The purpose is for the student to produce their personal educational products, ideas, hypotheses, texts on the basis of their personal knowledge and experience. 
it goes without saying uh, that uh, there could be no 100% independent work. This is uh, uh, not very serious. In our case, so we mean uh, independent work, autonomous work, which is regulated by teachers. At the present, uh, this sphere is a sphere of great interest. At the same time, it is not uh, well studied uh, and it requires uh, joint effort, uh, interdisciplinary uh, effort uh, of, uh, of, of teachers, of uh, language teachers, uh, uh, specialists in education, and uh, uh, the importance of uh, student activity, independent student activity does not preclude the role of the teacher. Uh, working uh, with the information in this kind of approach requires in this process uh, the important role of the teacher, the teacher who has relevant qualification. Uh, knowledge transfer is a very complicated process centered on an individual. And uh, the role of the teacher is very important in this process because uh, the teacher is uh, the person who has the knowledge. And uh, it's important for the teacher to know to transfer not only explicit knowledge, but also implicit knowledge, which is derived from the personal experience and which can be transferred through direct contact, only, even with the help of the computer. The interaction of the teacher and the student in the context of foreign language communication is a subject matter. It can be productive only if uh, this communication relies on common knowledge. And here we mean background knowledge, stable background knowledge, and dynamic background knowledge relating to specific situations. Teaching students uh, uh, how to use uh, foreign language communication requires uh, uh, expanding the knowledge of the teacher and special knowledge of the teacher from the field of um, specialization of the student. Acquiring this knowledge uh, will make it possible for the foreign language teachers to organize uh, a very high quality educational process when the teacher is not just a moderator, but a full-fledged participant in the professional communication. The knowledge of the professor, um, his competencies, which make it possible to assess not only foreign language competence of the student, but also to assess his knowledge of the subject matter and how the student can use this knowledge in the course of professional communication in a foreign language is very important for the student, a very good motivating force. And the role of the teacher as the source of knowledge, and that, that happens very often in our practice, uh, when the teachers know um, special subjects, and that requires uh, better, better knowledge of foreign language teachers in the professional field of the student. On the basis of this sphere, the student, the, the teacher, should take refresher courses, go abroad, and work at various um, uh, organizations. Taking into account uh, the nature of education, what is important is cross-disciplinary communication uh, between teachers of various subjects. And uh, this uh, cross-disciplinary uh, contact can take the form of lecture participation, taking part in uh, various uh, conferences. What is the outcome of this um, consideration? Uh, the result is uh, that uh, the correct uh, concept uh, that uh, during uh, studying, uh, during uh, teaching uh, foreign language communication, we teach only foreign language and not the speciality in a foreign language. Uh, this requires uh, a more flexible approach and uh, is not uh, uh, absolutely acceptable as uh, is, is not uh, um, acceptable um, as the only approach. Another important element here is the quality of education, and the quality of education uh, is reflected in the quality of teaching and quality of learning. And the third factor, uh, this is uh, the uh, center on the result of education, focusing on the result of education. And in the academic community, the connection between the academic community, university, and uh, potential employers studying uh, the requirements of the employers towards a uh, university graduate and reflecting uh, these requirements in the process of education and including these comp competencies in the education process is of great importance. At the time, a very tough uh, competence uh, uh, competition 
in the labor market. Dear colleagues, I would like to express my hope that during the work of our conference and the workshops, we shall have a, a fruitful exchange of opinion, experience, so we'll together look for prospects of further development of the language education process. And we, in this way, you will be able to create a new environment, education environment, which we'll discuss next time. Thank you for your att attention. Thank you, Professor Kolikova. I would like to remind the participant that you can ask your questions and send your comments uh, using the Google form, and there is a link to it at the, at the bottom. Professor Kulikova mentioned some interesting aspects. She mentioned that it's important to follow the expression of the face. And we know it's not all, always easy because we don't have the feedback. I uh, understood that at, the, uh, at some moments that I should be more attentive about my own face expression during this online conference. It is also important, I believe, that Professor Kulikova uh, focused the role of the teacher in the education process because some hot heads nowadays call for digitalization of everything, the minimal role of the teacher, let us record the lecture, the uh, lectures, and in this way get rid of direct communication with the teacher. And uh, I would like uh, to ask you a question uh, about students and uh, their concern about creating their own image. If we look at the situation at our university, for example, our students are fighting for every percent in their rating because rating is important. It contributes to their image, to their bonuses. What is your impression? How can we direct uh, this situation into a positive uh, direction so that it doesn't become simply a tough competition for their ratings, but uh, should result in better uh, results of the education because quite often this uh, uh, rank, uh, rating fighting does not always translate into real progress in the education. How can we make uh, this uh, uh, situation, uh, this uh, competition more positive? I understand what you are driving at. I myself witnessed uh, this phenomenon and uh, I am uh, convinced that uh, the uh, focus on the individual is very important uh, and students uh, student oriented uh, focused uh, approach and students real uh, interest in receiving knowledge which will be useful in the practical work in the future i think that uh, this is uh, the activity that we should uh, we should focus on individual trajectory trajectory of uh, student education the student uh, should understand uh, the, pra the practical importance should be interested in receiving professional information which they can get from the information the education process and uh, the um, uh, specific information, professional information, which they can share with uh, their fellow students by participating in various conferences and other activity. My experience shows that uh, um, if this is a really interesting activity, they forget about their rating and about their percentage. Uh, they show interest in the knowledge, which is very pleasant to witness, and we should develop uh, this kind of approach. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask another question about interdisciplinary approach, which you mentioned in your presentation. I think you have a, a good experience of communicating with your colleagues. So what is your impression? Do we have interdisciplinary approach at our university? Have we reached this level? Do uh, language teachers um, do their best? as far as professional knowledge is concerned, I mean, in the field of um, professional subjects for the students, do you have uh, any uh, impressions and any suggestions how these professional contacts can be improved, interdisciplinary contacts? Yes, um, uh, during the communication, the contacts with my colleagues and witnessing what's happening in the sphere of education, I can say that foreign language teachers for specific purposes simply have to, they're obliged, besides knowing a foreign language and knowing education methods, also to acquire additional knowledge. 
и на the subject matter, uh, which is the specialization of their students. This is necessary. And uh, in teaching foreign languages as a language of a profession, we cannot do uh, without this approach. I believe uh, that uh, the teachers are doing uh, very much and uh, the textbooks in the English language uh, which are published are a proof of that because many language, many textbooks are devoted to the language of profession. But I think it can be intensified, uh, including the study trips to maybe uh, organizations of, uh, of, of this profession and exchange of information with uh, the teachers of other disciplines. I think that uh, there is here room for improvement. Thank you. If you don't mind, another comment, which we have received from our participants who joined the conference. Thank, uh, so they write, thank you very, very much for this interesting presentation. The problem is very topical. Please explain the following. You talked about uh, peculiar uh, features of teaching uh, generation ZX, and uh, can we apply the same principle uh, for uh, students of, um, of other generations, for example, during the refresher con conferences? Thank you. This is really a very interesting uh, question, really interesting. These principles can be applied, some of them. That's, uh, that goes without saying. But we should also take into account the specific features of the older generation. Uh, these people um, are more accustomed to passive participation, more accustomed to receiving infor uh, information and knowledge. We should take this into account as well. But the methods which are good when we work with the modern generation Z and X, these methods are so interesting and they're so productive uh, that I think even uh, working with the older generation during the refresher course, for example, if uh, you have in your group uh, um, people from the previous generation uh, who show uh, the or demonstrate uh, all the features typical for the previous generation, which uh, slow down uh, the active education process, even with such groups, you should use gradually uh, the new methods because uh, these methods really are uh, con constructive and fruitful. And uh, on the other hand, our education process should be updated too. Yes, updating is important. Uh, this is a very important and topical issue. I think that many universities are now involved in this process to this or that extent. And I think that now we can uh, take one more question from our participants uh, and then we can move uh, to then another presentation. Let's go back to the in interdisciplinary approach and cooperation with teachers of, uh, special sub of specialized subjects. Are there any suggestions uh, how we can organize uh, these contacts, uh, how uh, these uh, uh, requirements should be synchronized? Uh, when our students, for example, prepare a presentation professionally oriented, we sometimes find out that what we sometimes what we require does not coincide with the requirements of teachers of the so-called specialized departments. From your point of view, how shall we organize? How should we organize this kind of cooperation? There is positive experience in this field, and I'll take up the second part of your question first. And must say that uh, this cooperation between ling uh, language uh, departments and uh, specialized departments uh, should be reinforced. This cooperation should be stronger, stronger in uh, various uh, fields. The positive experience here says that, uh, or I'll just mention the previous experience, uh, there was an attempt. Uh, uh, to uh, to uh, not not to let uh, foreign language teach, or rather to to have a group of uh, uh, foreign language teachers and uh, provide them with additional experience in the professional sphere. Uh, in that case, it was the economics. Then uh, those teachers uh, they have uh, taken and passed a very serious exam in economics and they received a diploma of 
uh, additional university education. And uh, uh, then they uh, organized the, the foreign language teaching using this information. That was very uh, successful experience. And I, I participated in this experience myself. And I am quite uh, sure that it was uh, uh, useful both for teachers and for students. Of course, so this uh, requires additional uh, effort on the part of the heads and the authorities of uh, language departments, but I think this is a, a promising approach. Thank you very much. I think that uh, we can close this part of our uh, session and we can now move to the next uh, presentation. And the next presentation is very close in uh, the approach uh, uh, to what uh, Professor Kulikova suggested. Our next speaker is a representative <coughs> of, uh, 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 is from the University College Institute of Education, and uh, Andy is interested in uh, student research in preparing the master's program. He has a rich experience of practical work in the field of further education, university education. Among his interests are uh, teaching uh, English for special purposes, for academic purposes, and I will repeat once again that this is very close to what Professor Kulikova was mentioning in your presentation. He's a member of the International Association of English Language Teach Teachers, teaching as a foreign language, a member of TESOL, and has been involved in specific uh, in special groups of uh, ITEL since their uh, establishment. And uh, the subject of his presentation is languages for specific purposes, a view from 2021. So Andy, if you can hear us, uh, join us. I know you are using Zoom and the, uh, the floor is yours. Working from University College London at the moment. And my talk is related to what Professor Kulikova has just said. Um, at the moment, I teach mainly research methods. I've slowly moved over the last 10 or 15 years from teaching EAP to research methods students to actually teaching research methods itself. But I spent most of my life teaching ESP, particularly EAP. Um, so I'm interested in looking at how things have changed in the time that I've been involved since the 1960s up to 2021. So basically in the last 50 years. 50 years. What I'm saying is very practical thoughts based on um, what I've been doing. So this is the way that ESP, languages for, specific, languages for specific purposes, um, my experience is with English, um, but I think what I'm going to say is relevant for teaching any language. This is typically, I think, how we think of ESP. Um, if you notice there, we've got a distinction between EMT, English as a mother tongue, and ESL, EFL, English as not a mother tongue. And I think to a large extent, ESP has been related to English as a second or foreign language. Um, I don't think that's true anymore, but I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, ESP is normally considered to be quite new, 1960s it started, although Difficult to find evidence, but I'm sure that ESP languages for specific, no, sorry, languages for specific purposes, I think, has probably existed as long as language and cultures have existed. Um, when people started speaking, started trading, I'm sure that business in business languages were, were necessary in those days. So I think ESP languages for specific purposes, okay. E didn't exist in the early days, but I would think that that's as old as old as anything. Um, so we distinguish between ESP, which is um, language with a specific purpose, with some kind of purpose, and general English or general language, which maybe this is unfair, language which has no purpose. I'm not sure if that is relevant, if that is true these days, but that I think is the traditional distinction. Um, you teach languages for specific purposes for people who have needs 
and who have interests and general links with people who don't. Is that fair? Probably not. Um, first law that we need to distinguish between teaching English to mother tongue speakers and, each, and teaching English to um, second or foreign language speakers. Is that distinction relevant these days? In the 60s, it probably was, but I'm not sure if it is relevant these days. Can we really distinguish between people who speak English as a first language or as a second or foreign language? I'm not sure. Many, many children, the ones I meet in London, are bilingual. Many children in England come into school, come to school not speaking English. Um, it's difficult to say what's their first language, what is their second language, how do they relate English? Um, I would think that's the same in Russia. From what I read, there are 35 official languages in Russia, the Russian Federation. Um, my guess, therefore, is that there are people, there are children who go to school who don't speak Russian. I might be wrong there, but that's my guess. But there are certainly um, 40 or 50 mother tongues in some of the London schools, and these are for kids who are born in, in England. So I'm not sure if distinction, this distinction between English as a mother tongue and English as a second or a foreign language is, is relevant anymore. I think the point, though, is that we can um, distinguish the reasons why people are learning English and their needs. Michael Long, the late Michael Long, who died recently um, in a book on needs analysis, not about LSP, basically says that all language courses need to be relevant, need to be seemed to relevant for specific groups of people. Um, and I think that's important. A lot of the research that I draw on comes from research for um, home students, native speakers in Australia, Michael Holliday and his colleagues there. A lot of the research I do draws on that. Um, so what he would say is that it's useful to think of every course, every course as involving some sort of specific purpose. Every language user uses language for a particular reason. There's no such thing as using language for no reason. So I think it's useful to think of this from a teaching point of view. To what extent can we take this into account and should we take it into account? Um, as I said, I'm an ESP teacher, I'm a LSP teacher, so let me give you a couple of ideas of what I think that means. I, I think it's a state of mind, it's an attitude, and it believes, I think, that it's possible to identify future language use. Some people don't agree, but I think this is um, an important characteristic of teaching LSP. Some, um, it's important, therefore, that we should be able to describe this language, and then we should be able to do something, you might call it teaching, facilitating, to enable people to learn that language. Some people disagree. They say, there's no way I can possibly um, change what happens in other people's minds. But I do think that most teachers think they can do that. So can we identify future language use? Can we describe that language? And can we teach it? Which means that LSP involves some sort of research, some sort of language analysis, some sort of course design, and some sort of materials production. Textbooks could play a part in this, but I think teachers need to use textbooks, not make sure that textbooks use the teacher. And from a theoretical point of view, all this is in the context of theories and models of second language acquisition. Models of language, models of learning, and models of teaching. Um, I started thinking about this a little bit, listening to colleagues talk. And these are some of the colleagues that I've heard in the last few years. Um, and I disagree with many of these. Um, So the, the first one says, I need to teach general English first, or general language, general Russian, general anything. Um, what is it? Um, is there a difference here between the audience, um, whether or not we're teaching mother tongue speakers or whether or not we're teaching second or foreign language teachers? As we've said, um, 
what we are normally concentrating on is second or foreign language teachers. But as Michael Long says, there is a need to be relevant. We need to be relevant to our learners' interests and needs. So the more we can do to find out what that is, the better. Um, we distinguish between ESL and EFL. Um, you might know that the British and the American usage is very, very different. Um, to British people, ESL is basically the ex colonies Nigeria, India, Hong Kong, Singapore, the places historically where um, English has had a political, a legal, and educational role, whereas EFL is for countries that do not make that distinction. I do not think we can distinguish that anymore. My guess is that there are kids who come to school in Moscow who speak English. Is that ESL, EFL? I don't know. Um, that's the context, I think. Um, whereas in America, if you study English in America, you consider it to be ESL students. If you study English in China, you consider it to be an EFL. So there's a distinction there that I think is probably not relevant these days, and we probably can't make those distinctions anymore. So back to what I mean for general English. If I'm assuming, as I have from this diagram, that we, we're not interested in whether or not our students have English as a first language, a second or a third, we're interested in their needs, their capabilities, what can they do? And it's certainly not the case that EMT speakers are better in any way than ESL, EFL learners. So I do not think we can say that the needs are different. I think we need to look at the needs of mother tongue, second or foreign language learners, and see what we can do. So we distinguish then, is it fair between ESP and general English? This is the normal way that people used to see ESP. ESP has purpose, it has reason, it's based on student need, general English doesn't. Is that fair? Um, Michael Long, uh, like Michael Long, I like Michael Long's books, um, talks about general language for no purpose courses. Is that fair? Probably not. Jerry Abbott in the 1980s um, came up with the acronym TINOR, teaching English for no obvious reason. And that contrasts with ESP, teaching English for a reason. So as I started saying earlier on, what is general English? It could mean some of these. It could mean some of these things. Some of these are impossible. Some of these are purposeful. Some of these are wide. Some of these are narrow. I don't know what you think general English is, but one of the things that people often mention is what they call the common core. The common core is that bit of language, English language, Russian, whatever, that is part of all other varieties. And the, one of the most famous grammar books um, in England from 1985 basically says that learners need to come to grips with basic English before they study um, English for specific purposes. I don't agree with that. Um, you can't teach English for engineers until the students have got a good basis in the language. I don't agree with that. You need something to build on. Um, this is often goes to Pitt Coder, um, one of the early applied, linguist, uh, applied linguists in the UK who drew this map. The three varieties here mentioned, then in the middle, you've got the common core. Common core is the vocabulary, the language, the grammar, whatever that is part of every variety. But what is often not taken into account is that as this common core is part of every variety, it's always part of any variety. Therefore, if our student wants to learn the blue circle here, they don't need to learn the common core first because the common core is part of their required repertoire, what they want to learn. So you don't need to teach common core first because common core is part of their ESP, whether or not they're English for doctors, English for nurses, economists, 
ESP varieties have verbs, they have nouns, they have adjectives, they have prepositions, they have articles. You don't need to teach articles before because um, all varieties of English have articles. So I don't think this idea of common code is very really useful here. Yeah. Certainly, I don't agree that you have to teach the common core first. As Michael Long says again, um, the problem with the common core, the problem with general language is that some of the um, general language is much too wide. Students don't need it, don't use it. Um, and some of it is too narrow in that it doesn't teach them everything they need. So it's either too narrow or too wide. I think we can do better. Nice quote from Michael Holliday, Holliday also, that there is no such thing as general register. Every use of language has purpose, except possibly in some English classes. So the important thing is, can we identify it? So if we think of every course as involving some kind of specific purpose, then the problem is, how can we identify that? And for financial reasons, for managerial reasons, sometimes we don't have um, the ability to do that. So what purpose? What purpose? Okay, I, my definition of ESP wasn't quite right uh, because ESP doesn't only depend on identifying purposes, but ESP traditionally distinguishes between e, um, English for work and English for study. Not English for travel. And I don't see the problem there. Um, if I teach hotel receptionists the language of hotel receptioning, that's ESP. If I teach a traveler who wants to use the same language, that's not ESP. And again, I'm not sure that I totally agree anymore with this distinction. Um, and then we call it EO, occupational, professional, and academic purposes. Not sure, again, if there is a distinction these days between occupational and professional. Um, all occupational um, workers need some sort of training and some sort of study. And can we distinguish between work and study? As I've said, can we really distinguish between work and study? A quick Google search through universities in England show that pretty much every university's website mentions something about employability. Employability is a feature of every undergraduate and postgraduate degree in this country. It has to be, there are government regulations. So I spent quite a lot of time um, a few years ago in adding an employability component to many of the courses I was teaching. Them. Again, I won't show you these in detail, but a quick random look through some of these. Employable, employability employability skills. Durham, prestigious universities, employer reputation, employability. Even Oxford, employability is important. University of Hertfordshire, where I, where I worked for a while, employability, focus on employability. Look at the top universities in UK, prestigious ones at the top for employability, Worldwide, Harvard and Yale come high for employability. Um, courses and lecturers try hard to involve this, but this is an example of how they sometimes get it wrong, so need to be a bit more careful. This was a course I was involved in, BA Leadership and Professional Development, first year students. These were all mature students and they were all part time, which meant they had jobs. They were doing a degree in order to get more promotion. Their first assignment was a proposal that they wrote as a letter to their manager, sent as an email. And many of them received very low marks, particularly for style, format, etc. I was told into the class to try to help. And what I learned was that they were getting low marks because they hadn't provided references in the academic way. These were mature students, they all had jobs. They knew that when they wrote an email to their manager, they didn't um, need to add references. 
So this was where the university, trying hard to make courses relevant, was getting it wrong. They needed to find another way of doing that. Students agree. Employability is important. Employers agree. And um, the British government, the QAA, is the British government's quality assurance authority. All bachelor's degrees need something to do with employability. So I'm not sure if we can really distinguish anymore between EOP, EPP, and EAP. But I think as long as we're looking at the needs of the students, we can deal with that. Okay, a few other, other things related to that, I think. Teaching approaches, um, we often make these distinctions. Um, lexical approach, communicative language teaching, task-based learning, all these modern ideas are normally associated with, general, associated with general English. I don't think they should be. And I think many of them developed out of ESP. Take communicative language teaching, for example. What does it mean? I think there are two possible interpretations of communicative language teaching. One is this. It's the teaching of communicative language. Communicative language, that means appropriate language, relevant language, correct language, the kind of language that people use in the real world, not what the grammar book says. ESP has always done this. The other view is the communicative teaching, this is that we're teaching methods. Classroom practice, roles of teachers, roles of learners. I think ESP has always done this from the very early days. If we look at um, Howard and Widdison's history of English language teaching, we see on the contents page, ESP is mentioned in the chapter on communicative approaches. So ESP has always been relevant there. Task-based learning, um, pretty much new. Sorry, I'm getting old. It's not so new, but it was new not many years ago. Um, but ESP has always done that, has always done that. Real-world tasks have always been part of ESP. Um, Rod Ellis refers to Michael Long's 1985 reference to tasks, but a, a very well-known bit of research carried out in 1979 by James Herbolic called Box Kites. Basically, the students had to design, fly, write a report on box kites. That was very, very early task-based English language teaching. I think ESP has always been task-focused. Sometimes because there's nothing else you can do. You figure out what, why the students need language look at the tasks and try and identify the language that they need. Lexical approach, yes, ESP. EAP particularly, you might know of Everett Coxhead's academic word list, 570 common academic words. It's become very important in EAP, still very general, but at least this is becoming quite specific. And it's led to a lot more studies of very specific word lists for engineering, doctors, medicine. This is new, but I think it's probably always existed. I've got some old English for business textbooks and they emphasize language, emphasize vocabulary. So I think we're getting somewhere of the way I like to see the English language teaching world. Maybe it's not fair to call it tenor, because I think a lot of general English teaching does have purposes. We make a distinction between ESAP, English for specific academic purposes, and English for general academic purposes. I don't actually think there is such a thing as English for general academic purposes. Going back to what Halliday says, all language use has a purpose. People never use language. There are no such thing as academic as general academic texts. All academic texts are specific. So I do not think that distinction makes sense. However, EGAP textbooks have always existed. This is quite an early one. If we look at the contents page, we get something like that. Pre-1990, 
more up to date. Another book, pretty much the same. And you will notice that both of them mention definitions. If I can just mention a bit of research by John Swales, this is how you would traditionally write a definition. A is a B which C. Metaproth Metaproteins are the group of substances which are produced. That's typical. And if you look at any of the general EAP textbooks, you'd finish up teaching that. However, this is how lawyers define it, according to Swales. Very, very different. So I think we do need to be aware of the specific nature of language in different subjects. Some research that I did, trying to look at all the assessment in a particular university. We basically looked at all the, we sampled all the assessments across the university in one particular year, about 3,500 altogether. And we categorized them in various ways along the top, according to different disciplines down the left-hand side. Doesn't really matter at the moment what is along the top. The important thing is the difference. The darker, the shading, the more prevalent were these assessment practices. And the point that I want to make now is that they're different. They're different. Different subjects have different emphases in their assessment. Look at practice-based work related for a while, and you see white, which means not, and dark brown, which means more than 50% of their assessments. We're trying to test this. So they're different. We need to bear this in mind. Um, along the bottom there, if we're doing English for specific academic purposes, we've got various subjects that we need to deal with. What have we got here? Business purposes, science and technology, legal purposes along the bottom. You might have heard of Hilary Nessie and Sheena's um, Bo, British Academic Written English Corpus where they basically collected six and a half billion words of academic English written by students. Classified that into 13, what they call genre families. And again, what's not important, what's important, it's not important now what they are. The importance is that if you look at these different discipline areas, you find that their use of these different genres is very different. Arts and humanities, as you would guess, write a lot of essays. Life sciences, as you can guess, write a lot of um, research reports, case studies, things like that. And if you go through, you find that they differ quite a lot. Which again is arguing against EGAP and for ESAP. And again, you see the differences here with some of the professional type of genres that they write, how they vary. But of course, as Professor Kulikova said earlier on, there's a lot of mixed, a lot of interdisciplinary studies these days. And different people need to mix genres and they need to learn different genres. Again, ESP can handle it as long as we're aware that we need to look at the needs of students. And how narrow can we get EMP English for medical purposes, doctors, nurses, how narrow can we get? I'm not sure. A couple of other things worth mentioning, um, EAP courses particularly, or ESP courses can be taught independently. More often these days they're they're integrated into the student's work or study in various ways, either CBI or CLIL, which are slightly different but related. In all these cases, you're trying to integrate in some way the language with the content. CLIL, I think, is a little bit different because I think has a dual purpose of teaching both the language and the subject, but the CBI courses, I think, have more of a focus on the language using the subject as a vehicle. But there's a narrow line between sheltered and clear, I think. 
We teach things um, before, while, and afterwards. Um, more relevant for professional English, I think. Uh, for EAP, I don't think students really want to learn academic English after they've graduated, but quite often we teach professional English after students have graduated. And up to date nowadays, EMI is becoming more popular. Not sure exactly what EMI is. It does, it is distinguished from English as a mother tongue. So if I teach, like I do, I teach research methods students in London. That's an EMT country. I teach Chinese students mainly. That's EMT, that's a mother tongue country. Um, if I was teaching the same in China, I think because I'm English, I'm a native speaker, that would not be considered to be EMI, English Medium Instruction. I work with a Hungarian colleague. When she teaches in London to Chinese students, that's EMT. If she was teaching exactly the same thing back in Hungary, I think that would be considered EMI. So I'm not sure exactly what distinction, what distinction, what this distinction is these days. And we don't know where we are. I teach students, most of the students I'm teaching at the moment are from China, some of them are in China. Um, when I'm teaching with Zoom, I have got students in Paraguay, students in Peru, students in the south of United States, students in China, students in Indonesia. The context, I don't think it matters anymore, as long as we are aware of students' interests and students' needs. So this is a bit of a mess, but this is how I like to see things now. E is in brackets because I think it could be Russian. I think it could be any language. Somehow we're teaching English. It doesn't matter if we're teaching it as a first language, a second language, or a foreign language, as long as we're aware of the needs of the students. We need to think about the context. What's the environment? It, it is a little bit different if they're in London compared to if they're in Bangkok. What's the purpose? Think of methodologies, communicative language teaching, lexical approach, task-based learning. And then again, we're back to needs. Su is survival purposes. So we've got occupational purposes, academic purposes, survival purposes. I think I include the traveler checking into a hotel there. So I think that is how I would like to see things, with a focus on student needs, a student on identifying the language that they need, whether or not it's possible in primary and secondary school students. I'm not sure, but I think we can do better than we often do. And here are some references that you'll be able to see later, I think. So I hope that's useful. Um, I hope you've got some questions and things to say. I hope Dimitri is going to, going to give me some questions. Ваш доклад уложились в замечательно. Thank you for your report. You used your time limit very efficiently. Of course, there are questions. I will mention them in Russian, and the interpreters will help you with the translation into English. I hope it's satisfactory. So, from your point of view, if there is no difference in the various, uh, uh, in uh, this difference. So, so what's your attitude to threshold descriptors, which are also based on student needs? So your attitude to threshold descriptors, which uh, are also based, based on students' needs? No problems, I think. The descriptors can apply to anyone, as far as I can see. Uh, whether or not you speak English as a first language, a second language, or, or a foreign language, I think the descriptors can apply. Can't they, or am I misunderstanding you? Думаю, что в этом заключался вопрос. Да, вопрос не от меня, я просто ретранслирую. I think that was the answer to the question. I think that was the answer which the participant expected. Second question: Do you think that general English, which is uh, uh, is uh, uh, the basic approach? and specialized language like um, in medicine or geology. This is a kind of superstructure. General English is the basic 
uh, structure and uh, um, other types of language, medical or uh, geological, is uh, the superstructure. No. Я так не думаю. I think you can organize things in a better way. Я um, думаю, что можно лучше организовать все. Um, as I said, I think whatever the generally depends как exactly я уже depends говорил, what you mean. Depends what you mean by generally. По, о, по, под общим языком. Что мы понимаем под общим языком? Все зависит от этого. But by general English, if you mean Когда English for no particular языке, purposes, um, simply teaching what's in the grammar book, I don't agree. I think you can do better than that. Most of the textbooks, most of the global English language textbooks I see are survival, tourist, tourism type textbooks, I think. I, I don't know what the Russian um, secondary school textbooks deal with, but I would expect to some extent that they are looking at some perceived student need in the future. Although I'm not sure if Russian, for example, teenagers really have clear ideas of where they want to go in their careers. Certainly, I didn't until I was about 25. So it depends what you mean by general English. Another question. In the Russian universities, there is a dilemma when not to start teaching the language of profession after uh, specialized courses have been delivered or not, because sometimes there is this time difference. It's too early to start ESP uh, because the students don't know the subject matter, uh, the subject matter of their profession. So from your point of view, when ESP should be started? As soon as possible. I would say the students always have some idea of the subject they're studying. That's why they've chosen it. And I think the earlier that you can, I think we're talking as much about motivation here as anything else. I don't know if your students are motivated to learn English, but I think, um, and as Professor Kulikova said, we talk a little bit about identity. If students identify as scientists or economists um, when they start university, I think you can make use of it, sounds very negative this, about their motivations and their identity to help them with English. Again, I don't know. How motivated are, are your students to learn English? It depends on that a, a little bit, I think. It's difficult to disagree with that eh, because uh, the motives uh, are very important uh, and many conference participants uh, when they enter the classroom quite often note uh, that uh, this, uh, the motivation of the students uh, should be increased because quite often we see they're not motivated enough. And you thank you very much. Can, can I just uh, say, say uh, something else about uh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, I'm supervising a lot of master students at the moment in London, and for various reasons, most of them are from China. Not all, but most of them are Chinese. Most of them are Chinese females, all who love English. They've got first degrees in English, and they love everything about English. Something they don't realize, and I think it causes some trouble, is most of the students who they will teach will not love English. English is a tool, English is an imposition, a need to practice English because the Chinese university graduation involves English. And I think they can do better. The, the, the teachers love English, most of the students don't. I don't know if that's the same of the kind of people that you teach in Moscow. This is a truly... This is truly a question how to make students love uh, the language. And I think we shall raise uh, these questions during our conference. Now we move to our next uh, plenary reporter, David Singleton from Ireland. He has uh, a very rich experience. He worked in the Trinity College in the universities of uh, Hungary and Poland. His record includes the chairman of uh, the Association of Applied Linguistics, and also the president of European Second Language Association. He was uh, the 
uh, president of uh, the Association of uh, Second Languages. He is uh, the author of over 220 publications devoted to a broad range of subjects, with special attention given to the matters of cross, uh, uh, cross language um, influence and the age factor in mastering a language. Today's presentation um, is called the Phraseological Answers to Grammatical Conundrums. David, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, I'll try and share my screen now. Uh. Okay, this is very different from what we just heard. Um, can you, is that okay? Can you see me? I don't know. Uh, um, uh, this is a uh, fairly uh, um, uh, linguistic uh, talk. Um, it's not about teaching, this particular one. It's concerned with the um, nature of grammar. And when we consider the nature of speech and language, it's impossible to ignore the fact that the phenomenon of prime importance in popular mind in this connection is lexical. One thinks, for example, of the implications of the association between notions of words and speech to be found in many languages. Academic grammarians see their specialism as having two branches, syntax and morphology, the, the definition of both terms being lexically based. Syntax, from Greek syntaxis, putting things, put, putting things together in order, denotes the range of irregularities which can be observed in the combination of sentence com components, largely words, and the study of such regularities. Morphology derives from the Greek root morphe, meaning form or shape, and denotes the interna internal structure of words and the study thereof. Although the word is central to the way in which non-specialists and specialists alike think about language, de defining what a word is poses problems. Interestingly, the characterization of the word which seems to be least problematic is that which defines words in grammatical terms. The grammatical approach uses the criteria of positional mobility and internal stability. Words are said to be positionally mobile in the sense that they are not absolutely fixed to specific places in a sentence, the internally stable criterion refers to the fact that within words, the order of morphemes remains consistent. The grammatical approach uh, in this connection is not only the least, the least problematic, but also the one that works best across languages. This fact already speaks volumes about the connection between the lexicon and grammar. In addition to, to the obvious determinative effect of the choice of particular word categories um, on a sentence structure, there is also a word selection effect which is rather more probabilistic in nature. This latter effect relates to the fact that particular words are especially frequently to be found in the company with certain other words in a greater or lesser number of contexts. Thus, the selection of a given word is likely to be accompanied by the selection of another word or other words to have, in a sense, a habitual potential entourage, a range of likely phraseological possibilities. This phenomenon is referred to as collocation. Words which form collocations are repeatedly placed with each other. That is to say, they often uh, co-occur within, within a short distance of each other 
in speech and in, in written texts. The term phraseology looks at the phenomenon from the point of view of the larger structures which result from words keeping company with each other. <clears throat> the question which now presents itself is that of the extent to, to which what we think of as grammatical rules, i.e. morphosyntactic patterns and usage, are related to the phenomenon of habitual multi-word co-occurrence co and the implications of this phraseological or grammatical relationship. Large numbers of the sequences of words that we deploy and encounter in every, everyday speech and writing are clearly uh, combinations that we have available to us as more or less preferable, uh, sort of pre prefabricated chance. Such combinations ranging from fixed idiomatic expressions like cats and dogs, as in it's raining cats and dogs, to semi-fixed combinations such as to know one's onions and to be up to all the tricks. Why we rely to this extent on ready-made material rather than constructing new phrases out of individual words every time may have to do with the fact that similar situations re recur in life and tend to be referred to in similar ways. It may also have to do with the fact that we prefer to save effort wherever possible. It certainly has to do with the fact that the demands made on us by the extreme rapidity of speech production are such that we have to exploit every opportunity to make savings on processing time. There has long been psycholinguistic evidence to suggest that fixed expressions and formulas have an important economizing role in speech production. That is to say, <clears throat> that using prefabricated expressions enables us to produce speech which is very much more fluent than it would be if we had to start from scratch and build up, every, uh, build up piece by piece every expression, every structure we use. The general importance of the contribution of collocational knowledge uh, to linguistic competence has been discussed by many uh, researchers in the past. I name a couple there. This notion was taken a stage further by Sinclair, okay, who established the co-build project. Sinclair developed the idea of economy of effort by people application into the so-called idiom principle. <clears throat> he used the term idiom with a broader application than its use as a label for fixed expressions with meanings that cannot be deduced from the meanings of their component parts. The idiom, idiom principle, as defined by Sinclair, states that when we are putting together phrases, although it may look as if uh, we are operating on the basis of open choice at every stage, the way we operate most of the time is to draw on our knowledge of pre-constructed pre or semi-pre-constructed phrases varying lexical content when within uh, the relative environments to a fairly limited extent. In fact, according to Sinclair, what we are doing in general is drawing on um, our knowledge of pre-constructed or semi-pre-constructed phrases that constitute single choices varying lexical content within the, the chosen pattern to a quite limited extent. So in Collins' uh, uh, co-built uh, English grammar, there is discussion of the relationship between single words and related multi-word uh, combinations, such as arrange, make an arrangement, suggest, make a suggestion. Clearly in cases where the multi-word synonym is used, it results from a, a unitary choice similar to cases where the single word is deployed. Sinclair's conclusion to his 1991 book runs as follows. While grammars and dictionaries continue to report the structure of language as if it could be neatly divided 
uh, many of these people who are professionally, many of those people who are professionally engaged in handling language have known in their bones that the division into grammar and vocabulary obscures a very central area of meaningful organization. He go on to, goes on to argue that when we have thoroughly pursued the patterns of co-occurrence of linguistic choices, there will be little or no need for a separate residual grammar or lexicon. The implication is that the choices in question may lie principally in the area of collocational or phraseological patterning. The links between phraseology and grammar have been pointed out in a number of recent articles. Especially interesting in this connection is Claire Hill's reminder to us of Halliday's notion of lexicogrammar. Halliday, like Sinclair, was greatly influenced by Firth's work, notably by his view um, that no aspect of lexis or grammar can be properly defined without reference to its typical context of use or co-text, uh, that is to say, in actual stretches of uh, uh, text or discourse. Mm -hmm. Halliday's lexicographical perspective incorporates Firth's central tenet that the language signs, the, the language signs are mutually dependent on and defined by those other signs with which they are habitually, habitually used. This is what first says, the collocation of a word is not to be regarded as mere juxtaposition. It is an order of mutual expectancy. The words are mutually expect expectant and mutually prehended. Some researchers have taken a very radical view of the way things work, asking themselves whether grammar in fact grows out of collocation of formulacity and phraseology. Thus, uh, Hoey suggests that the structure, uh, stru the structure of language derives from lexical patterns. He says, as a word is acquired through encounters with it in speech and writing, it, became, it becomes cumulatively loaded with, this, with contexts and cotexts in which it is encountered. And our knowledge of it includes the fact that it co-occurs with certain other words in certain kinds of contexts. On this view, grammar is merely a result of the pervasiveness of collocation. Each of us, uh, says Hoyt, are presumably to, a, to different extents and with different outcomes, constructs a grammar leaky, inconsistent, incomplete, out of the primings we have for the sounds, words, phrases that we encounter. This grammar, or perhaps one should say, these grammars may in turn be used to regulate our linguistic choices. Um, and the whole usage-based approach to language acquisition is very much in tune with this perspective. This is a quotation from Nick Ellis, who is very much into usage uh, approaches. He says, language knowledge involves statistical knowledge, of, um, so humans learn more easily and process more firmly high frequency forms and regular patterns, uh, which are exemplified by many types and which have few competitors. Usage-based perspectives of acquisition Thus hold that language learning is the implicit associative learning of representations that reflect the probabilities of form function mapping. Language rules, including morphous syntactic rules, derive, according to this perspective, from structural regularities emerging from unconscious analysis of distributional characteristics of language import. <clears throat> okay. So I'd like to end with a brief look at a very recent study which further explores um, 
the role of phraseology in connection with phenomena usually thought of as falling into the category of grammatical phenomena. The study is Leszniewska's 2019 account of English articles, which are traditionally dealt with in linguistics and in the language classroom by an assortment of grammatical rules. The efficaciousness of the, this approach is questionable. Um, Leszniewska says, there is evidence that for some L2 learners, articles remain a problematic area, even at advanced, possibly even native-like levels of attainment. Leszniewska points out uh, that language article, English language article usage has not much been studied in a phraseological perspective. She says, virtually the whole, uh, sorry, virtually the entire body of research on articles deals with the issue from the perspective of grammar. It seems that to date, researchers have not explored the use of articles in, an L2, in, in L2 English from the perspective of formal ethnicity. Mm. She presents two studies focusing on the question um, of which uh, collocational or phraseological formulaic factors seem to be key in, in Polish ESL learners. Uh, uh, sorry, Polish ESL learners attempts to cope with English article usage. Her results indicate that her participants, quote, were consistently more successful at using articles when they appear in word combinations that are frequent. This can be interpreted as a sign of the idiom principle at work, and that learners were generally more likely to use an article correctly, could if the obligatory, if the obligatory occasion for its use occurs in the sign of lexical bundle, than if the context for its use is a combination of words which do not frequently co-occur. These findings strongly suggest that the use of articles by these ESL learners was related to their experience of phraseological ties between words rather than to given rules. It should be added that, um, of course, uh, the learners in question had no help or hindrance at all from their mother tongue, Polish, since this language, in common with, with uh, all Slav languages, and many Asian languages has no, no articles whatsoever. Okay, so I, my, I'll uh, I want to conclude now. Uh, as, the, as the data from Leszniewska's work shows, or show, I should say, it does seem to be the case that the frequency of uh, the frequency of collocation plays the major role in what is picked up in terms of patterning in L1 and L2. The variable, uh, variable, variable behavior of articles in English and the fact that, for example, in the L2 domain, such behavior is completely mastered only by users of English who are very experienced, uh, says a very great deal about how grammar is and is not acquired. So um, the fact that only very experienced English learners, in fact, native speakers of English, uh, can do English articles properly or almost properly, um, uh, suggests that grammar isn't the answer. Aberrations in article usage in English seem to require for remediation, not more learning of rules, but simply more opportunity to take on board less usual collocations and contents. Uh, as with articles, so I would contend with the entirety of the lexical grammatical acquisition enterprise. To return to the general question of grammar and phraseology, Carter talks about a symbiotic relationship between form and meaning and clines of varying degrees of fixity and pattern. 
in which all of this uh, we can recognize not only the way in which vocabulary combinations function, but also the structure of what we call the rules of grammar. It is evident that, uh, it's evident that what we categorize as grammar is a set of phraseological patterns of a high degree of fixity. But as uh, Leshny Asker's work on articles demonstrates, fixity in which chinks of variability often show through. These exceptions are not anything other than a, a reminder of the usage oriented, uh, the, the use originated basis of the patterns and or the variable nature of this usage. So thank you for your attention. Um, here are some of the key references in, uh, um, that I've uh, used in the, the talk. And uh, now I end my show. Nope. Спасибо, Дэвид. Um, Thank you, David. Uh -huh. Thank you for this most uh, interesting presentation. Uh, colleagues, uh, I'd like to remind you that you are welcome to ask questions uh, using the appropriate link. Uh, David, if you will allow. Yeah. Uh, the... Indeed. Um, great. Uh, Перевод, переводчики, переключите, пожалуйста. Раз, два, три. Меня слышно сейчас? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes, we can hear okay. you. Uh, David, please uh, let us. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Все, хорошо. Спасибо большое. Значит, наверное. Um... Двумя движущими силами эффективного общения, эффективной коммуникации являются um, конвенциональность и определенный такой творческий uh, посыл, скажем так, creativity. Mm, I'm not getting... Вы достаточно uh, подробно останавливаетесь на конвенциональности. Um, uh, вы говорите о вот таких more or less prefabricated chunks. Да? А что с вашей точки зрения служит um, толчком к инновационному выражению значения? Uh, к, вот, к словотворчеству, к творчеству в uh, коммуникации? I apologize, my mistake. The question is about conventionality and creativity yep. uh, for effective communication and what from the vantage point serves as a basis for innovative and creative, creative ways of expressing meaning. Ah, that's interesting, yes. I mean, I mean there, there, have to be some, there has to be some departure in, uh, from the conventions and uh, the, uh, the patterns that have been used on occasions. Yes, I, I, do, I don't think that's... I don't think that's a contradiction in reading the fact that there are usage-based patterns and the fact that we we move away from those patterns from time to time. Uh, that, that's, that I, I don't see a contradiction there at all. I'm not saying that all every bit of language we use is based on uh, conventional uh, conventional uh, um, patterns. I say, I would I, would, I think that. The basis of what we do in uh, using so-called grammar is based in that way. But uh, of course, I accept there is a creativity uh, dimension to, to our use of language. Of course, I, I, um, uh, which is mysterious and uh, uh, which uh, um, we have yet to explore more fully. Thank you, David. We do not seem to have any more questions, so we shall participate, our participants of the plenary session. I would like to remind uh, you all that uh, Professor Kulikova and, and uh, David will participate in our further workshops. They will arrange master classes and seminars. If you are registered for them, you can participate. In conclusion of the plenary session, I would like to say a few words about our further program for us to have a better understanding 
we're finishing with the plenary session a little bit earlier. You see the timetable for our further events. So the next event is the work of the e-poster sessions, and the references are on the site. The links are to be found on the site. You can choose the sessions that you are interested in. Don't forget, please, that the files are quite big, and you can increase them to uh, have a better view. In the file which you received with the uh, links, there is a link to the session of the standard reports. Uh, what does it mean? We report, we invite to the stand uh, speakers to join the Zoom conference at the time indicated at the, at the, in the program from 12.45 to 1.30 p.m., the e-poster sessions. And if people are interested in the in your presentation, people will get in, in touch with you, and you will be able to um, answer the questions to your presentation. After the e post session, we we'll have a lunch break. So somehow I cannot move my timetable. Uh huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. After the lunch break, we start working in the parallel sessions. You have the program of the work of the sessions, and you can find it on the site. I want to remind you that no, not all the sessions will be functioning today, and it's mentioned in the program. Quite a number of sessions will be accompanied by simultaneous translation. Please get, in, get acquainted with the um, program. After the sessions, there will be the time for master classes, round tables, and workshops. And it's indicated in our timetable. We plan one hour uh, for this communication, and then it will be up to the moderator whether to continue them or not. Or not. From 6.30 to 7.30, it's time for our e-book fair. And as to the manuals and textbooks and um, and uh, scientific books are available for your information, and you can find uh, the uh, click uh, on our site. So when you click uh, this, you will see a list uh, of uh, manuals of the textbooks. And uh, after you have studied the presentation, uh, uh, then from 6.30 uh, to 7.30 p.m., you can use uh, the uh, link and uh, communicate again with the authors of the textbooks that you are interested in. The last point is networking with a question mark. We understand that you may be very tired at the end of the working day and the constant working in the online regime. That's why we have a question mark. Are there any questions that you would like to raise? So. If you want to discuss anything with your colleagues, write to us. So, And if we see that there is a need for networking after the end of all the events, uh, then uh, we'll uh, offer to you a link in the file and uh, conduct uh, other events related to the networking. Uh, so far, I understand there are no questions or comments. We have not received any. So, uh, our first plenary session is uh, closed. We have now time to get acquainted uh, with the post sessions and uh, with the uh, e-book e fair and come back uh, at 2 o'clock, but it will be again in the framework of sessions. Thank you.